whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the and truth. And nothing but the truth. Do sit down, Mr. Brereton. Uh, Mr. I'll work out which of you is which, won't I, presently. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Brereton. Is your full name Peter James Hazy? Yes. And uh, is your business address level 1535 Burke Street, Melbourne? That's correct. And are you a director, deputy chair and member representative on the board of CSF Proprietary Limited? That's correct. And Mr Hazy, have you attended the commission today in answer to a summons dated the 31st of July 2018? I have. Do you have the original of that summons with you today? I do. I tender that summons, Commissioner. Exhibit 5.236, the summons to Mr Hazy. And have you made two statements in response to rubrics given to you by the commission, Mr Hazy? I have. And uh, is the first of those statements dated the 24th of July 2018? Yes. Do you have the final uh, signed version of that statement with you today? I do. I tender that statement and the annexures to it, Commissioner. And I take it uh, the content of the statement is true, is it? Um, it is, Commissioner. It? Yes, thank you. Uh, a statement of Mr Hazy of 24 July 18, uh, Exhibit 5.237. Uh, yes. And the second of your statements, um, Mr Hazy, is that dated the 3rd of August 2018? That's correct. And uh, is the content of that statement true and correct? Yes, it is. Do you have the final version of that statement uh, with you today? I do. I tend to that second statement, Commissioner. Thank you. And the annexures to it. Thank you. The second statement of Mr Hazy and its annexures is Exhibit 5.238. My friend Mr Denelli will ask you some questions yes. now, Mr Hazy. Thank you. Mr Burton. Yes, Mr Denelli. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr Hazy. My name's Albert Denelli and I'm one of the council assisting the Royal Commission. Mr Hazy, you've been a director, as I understand it, of CSF uh, for... Uh, well, since 2010, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and you're presently the Deputy Chair? Yes. And, of course, you're well aware of a trustee's obligations in, in that capacity? Yes, I am. Uh, and aware of the trustee's obligations to act in the best interests of members? Yes. And to give priority to the duties to and the interests of members where there is a conflict? Yes. And, of course, to comply with what's known as the sole purpose test yes. in the CIS Act? Um, in preparing your statement, are there any issues that you um, have given you cause for concern in relation to those duties? In preparing my statement, yes. I, I have been made aware of some potential conflicts of interest. Um, and what are they? So they're, they're with respect to a particular arrangement with a particular a service provider and an employee. Uh, is that a reference to Australian family? It is. OK, and we'll come to that. Were there any other issues that um, concerned you in the preparation of your statement? No. Can I ask you about some questions about the fund itself before we come to Australian family and some other issues? The first is, in your first statement, you set out some attributes of the fund. And am I right to say that the as at the 30th of June 2017, the funds under management were approximately $8.7 billion. That's correct. And now, at least at the time of preparing your statement, um, it's a, over $9.3 billion. At the time, yes. Um, and, and over the last five years, in your statement, you, uh, you've, in, in the form of a table given evidence as to the fact that the number of members has increased from approximately 69,000 to approximately 75,000? That's correct. And over that time, um, the average balances of the members of the fund um, have also increased considerably? That's my recollection, yes. Yes, so in financial year 2013, approximately 76,000 and now the average balance is approximately 115,000. That's correct. And whilst the fund has increased in size, one of the things that you have given, and when I say you, I mean the trustee has given active consideration to over the last few years, is to the question of whether or not to merge. That's correct. Um, and why has that been something to which the trustee has turned its mind? So the 
The benefits of a merger to members are clearly the benefits of the scale that those mergers would, would result in. Uh, and, um, and can you explain to the Commissioner how you understand that um, to apply to CSF? So in terms of the funds under management or the numbers of members that are in the fund, uh, any merger which would result in an increase in the number of members and the number of funds under management would, by definition, decrease the costs per member. And so, in that sense, the benefit of the scale would, would result. And am I right that there's been negotiations between Catholic Super and the Australian Catholic Superannuation Retirement Fund? That's correct. Um, and scale was very much one of the issues that was identified uh, in the past in relation to your negotiations with um, the Australian Catholic Superannuation Retirement Fund. And still relevant. Um, in fact, or at least in October 2016, your CEO, Mr Pegan, presented a paper to the board in which he set out uh, set out his views as to some of the benefits of um, a merger. Do you recall the discussion at that time, or general discussion? General discussion, yes. Uh, and um, as a board, you um, obtained some advice and assistance from Rice Warner. That's correct. Um, who is Rice Warner? So they're a consulting firm providing actuarial actuarial analysis and other services. And if I can take you briefly to CSF.0001.0003.0001 CSF.0001.0003.0322. <coughs> As the documents called up, they um, do you recall right you've indicated that you recall Rice Warner um, giving some advice to the board. That was in relation to a merger assessment between CSF and what's called in the documents ACSRF. I do. Was this the letter or the presentation you're referring to? The presentation. I do, ref I do recall. And the there was a later letter. Yes. Uh, yes. Sometime during the process of yes. the negotiation of the merger. I know the document, so if you... Well, perhaps if I can ask you if you recall that it's that one of the issues that was identified by Rice Warner was that the superannuation industry will undergo, un, was undergoing many changes over the next few years and expected there to be a smaller number of larger funds? Yes, I do recall that. Yep, and that was because of increased competition and uh, between funds, downward pressure on fees, etc. Yes. Uh, and At 0324, uh, I think consistent with your evidence so far this afternoon, funds which want to provide a wide range of services at a competitive price will need scale. Yes. And Rice Warner's view was that CSF and ACSRF both face individual challenges as to how to grow from their current positions and there are considerable strategic advantages to both in considering a merger. Yes. And that was the view of the board at that time as well. Just conscious of the time, is that a convenient time, yes. Commissioner? I'm sorry, Mr Hayes, we'll have to get you back here in time to begin again at 2 p.m. Adjourn to two o'clock.
do come back into the witness box. Okay. Sit down, please. Yes, Mr. Donnelly. Thank you, Commissioner. Before lunch, Mr. Hazy, I was taking you to the first stages of discussion about a merger. Yes. If I could take you to CSF.0001.0003.0218. about to take you to a note prepared for an extraordinary board meeting on the 17th of March 2017. I can just have blown up the first two paragraphs. It is, sorry, under the, under why merge. It is now more difficult to rapidly gain economies of scale, sustain lower fees, broaden their services and communicate compelling benefits to members. Do you see that? Yes. And then there's reference to the challenges and pressures facing both your fund and the Australian Catholic Superannuation Retirement Fund. And then, despite this highly competitive and threatening environment, ACSRF and CSF have two major competitive advantages over most other funds, their membership loyalty and a thorough understanding of the Catholic market, its communities and how they operate. And then this goes on to set out then in the paragraph below, a number of synergies that would occur if the funds were to merge. And at that time, these were views which in were encouraging of the board, that is your board, to, to merge. Yes. Uh, and there were subsequently merger negotiations, weren't there? Yes. Um, if I could take you to SCS dot... Uh, sorry, perhaps if I could just tender that document, I'm sorry. Uh, extraordinary board meeting, uh, 17 March 17, CSF 0001 0003 exhibit 5.239. And, Commissioner, just before lunch, I didn't um, ask to tender the Rice Warner presentation. Uh, and perhaps I can regularise that by seeking to tender that document dated December 2016, merger assessment prepared by Rice Warner. Document of that description, SCF 001 0003 uh, exhibit 5.240. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and now, if I can go to SCS.0012.0013.0218. Are you aware that two statements have been prepared by representatives of um, SCS being the trustee of the Australian Catholic Superannuation Retirement Fund? I wasn't aware of two. I knew there were, was a statement at least. Yes, one of Mr Hartley and one of Mr Cantor. I'm going to take you to some documents now, which you may not have seen before, which set out various stages of the um, negotiations between yourself and the Sydney Fund, if I can call it that. Mm -hmm. And the first is SCS.0012.0013.0218. Who was the chair of CSF um, in March 2017? Peter Bugden. Uh, and he's been replaced now by Mr. Um, Mr. Casey, is that right? That's correct. Uh, and at the time, the, um, the chair of the <coughs> Sydney Fund, which for, for convenience, if I can call it that, was a Mr. Haddock, is that right? That's correct. Richard Haddock. Bear with us for a moment. Well, I'm Hayes. confused. If no one else is, what's the uh, doc ID? Um, Properly, what's the 
SCS. Dot SCS. Yes. Yes, SCS. Dot zero zero one two. Yeah. Dot zero zero one three. Yeah. Dot zero two one nine. Thank you. Thank you. And now this is an email from Mr Haddock, who you said was the chair of SCS at that time. Yes. Um, to, uh, to members of his board and other uh, executives of, of, of SCS. I haven't seen this document before. No, um, he yeah. says there that, I mean, in the second paragraph, that initial, there was some initial, so he refers to a meeting between Mr Cantor, being the CEO of CSS, and Mr Bugden, the chair of SCF, and Mr Pegan, the CEO of CSF. And he says, initial discussions um, canted on how we all thought, as did our respective boards, that a merger of the two funds made sense and would not only benefit our present members, but would place us in a stronger position to seek members in Catholic organisations outside education. Was that a view that was shared also by CSF? Well, certainly our view was that it was in the interest, best interest of uh, members of both funds. And we have many members, of course, outside well, education sectors. Uh, and, um, and he sets out at about point six of the page, we impressed upon them that this has to be seen as a merger of equals. And we explained what we meant by that and the importance of it for our members and employers. Frank, now that's a reference I think to Mr Pegan, then told us that their board accepts this but on the basis that they have their CEO as the ongoing one and that the chair comes from their board. Was that the position of CSF that it wanted in any merger both the CEO and the chair? That's certainly not the case, no. Uh, and Mr Haddock went on to say, we informed them that this was not acceptable to our board. Is it your evidence that it wasn't the um, position of CSF that it wanted both the CEO and the chairman at that time, to be, sorry, the chair, to be from CSF? That's certainly my understanding. There were various iterations of this agreement or negotiation? At this time, being um, in March 2017, were you aware what the position was? So my recollection is that at this time, there were discussions about one of those two positions resting with one fund and the other position resting with the other fund. And in fairness to you, I'll take you to some of those things in a moment. Um, and then the position did change then during the course of March or the position from CSF, if I take you to CSF.0001.0003.0361, now this is a letter dated the 27th of March. I'm not taking you, of course, Mr. Hazy, to um, each and every document, but this is a document that, as I understand it, was approved by um, the board. Do you recall seeing a version of this document? I do. Um, and there, it, in the second last paragraph, it says, the C CFS, sorry, CSF board remains unanimous, notwithstanding the detailed due diligence, thorough benefit analysis is incomplete, that a merger of our respective funds is likely to be in the best interest of our members. Do you see that? That's, that's certainly the case. And then the board of CSF provided its consent to the following arrangements down the bottom of the page. And it's here that it said that ACR, ACSRF chair would be invited to chair the board of the merged entity. So is that your recollection of what the position was? At that time, that was a, the position. Yep. And CSF chair would be invited to be the deputy chair? Yes. And the CEO and CIO of the merged entities would be from CSF? Yes. And four, over the page, the merged entity would be brought about by CSF being the successor fund? Yes. And five, the existing fund operations would be harmonised over a transition period of no more than two years? 
Yes, I recall all those. Um, can I tender that document, please, Commissioner? Letter CSF to the Chair of SCS dated, sorry, what date? Uh, dated the 27th of March 2017. 27 March 17, CSF 001-0003-0361, Exhibit 5.241. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, the response to that letter appears to be uh, CSF.0001.0003.0314. And this is a letter from Mr Haddock to Mr Bugden, so that is the Chair of the Sydney Fund. If I could take you to the bottom of that page. The board notes, that is the Sydney Funds board, notes your earlier request that the CEO of the combined fund come from CSF and your more recent request that the CIO and Deputy Chair come from CSF. Do you see that? Yes. <laughs> and the Sydney Fund put its position as the ACSRF board considers that these arrangements at management and board level should be determined by a process that identifies best candidates for the required roles. The ACSRF board believes that the identification of these roles and the candidates to fill them should be based on merit and should be undertaken as part of a process for the assessment of the needs of the combined fund. Yes. <coughs> um, that seems like a reasonable position, doesn't it, Mr Hazy, that was being put? Our view, our view here was that the nature of our fund and the relative performance of our fund was, was such that the CEO of the fund that would have been the continuing fund uh, should have come from CSF. Um, and in fact, if you go over the page, um, the board acknowledges that at the top and says, however, the ACSRF board also understands that as part of any merger, key leadership roles need to be put in place until those roles are determined by the new board. Yes. Accordingly, the board accepts your proposed key leadership roles for the chair being from its fund and the CEO being from CSF. Yes. And then the board proposes that these roles will continue during the first two years of the combined fund. By the end of that two year period, the ACSRF board expects that their ch the chair and deputy chair and the CEO will be determined by the new board, which would have been in existence in for two years and had the opportunity to judge performance of the parties in it, their roles. I understand the position, yes. Uh, Commissioner, if I could tender that letter dated the... 6 April 6 17, April. letter 6 April 17 ACS. RF to CSF, CSF 0001-0003-0314, Exhibit 5.242. And <clears throat> then on the 9th of May, so some um, some time later, a further letter was sent by CSF on the, um, to the Sydney Fund. If I can go to CSF.0001.0003.0349. And Mr Bugden, on behalf of your board says in this letter that despite our discussions and the various pieces of correspondence, seems we have reached impasse. You have consistently stated that ACSRF accepts CSF CEO and CIO. ACSRF should therefore provide the chair and the merge board composition must be equal from each fund. And <coughs> then the position on the third page, 0351, CSF then says, and I understand, I think this is, it seems there's a, a change of its position here. It says, unfortunately, the concerns are of such magnitude, that is, of, um, 
in relation to this issue of governance, they, that it says the CSF board has concluded new leadership is required to take the merged entity forward. Do you see that? Yes. We believe a new independent chair is essential. Yeah. And the chair should be someone who is not currently on the board of either fund who has a commitment to ensuring the long-term success of this substantial Catholic enterprise and who has the support of the Archbishops of Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. Yes. That was a change in CSF's position at that time. So if I can just... Yes, a change, yes. That it, um, as it wanted there to be an, uh, an independent chair rather than the chair coming from the Sydney Fund? Yes. Um, and this, the proposal then is that, that both, the chair, uh, both the chairs at that stage, I'm sorry, withdraw that. Then in the paragraph commencing, for the sake of such an important venture, Mr Bugden says he's indeed proposing we both stand aside immediately after the signing of a memorandum of understanding and entrust the merger to new leadership. Do you see that? Yes. How was it intended at that time that the board of CSF would be, uh, would be operating once there was a memorandum of understanding signed? Can you repeat that question please, Mr How Dillon? was it intended that the board of CSF would be chaired after um, the signing of the memorandum of understanding? So the, the board chair, the position of our board chair, CSF's board chair, uh, would stay in place until such time as that agreement was reached. Now, the, part of that agreement would have been for the, a new chair to succeed our chair. Uh, Can I just add some context here, if I may? You may. Um, the, the arrangements at this point hadn't got to the stage of a heads of agreement. Uh, we hadn't had a chance to discuss the, the proposition that a merger of equals would mean six plus six without any discussion of who might be the successor fund. And so all of these iterations of, of numbers uh, was still negotiating around who might be successor fund. Uh, what did it matter who would be the successor fund and who would be the merging fund? So from our point of view, the paramount consideration was the best interest of our members. And we're talking about a fund with exceptional performance over a long period of time. And those financial best interests of members was our paramount concern. Well, understanding that, why does it matter which fund merges into which? We took the view very strongly that there would be no circumstances where the retirement savings of our members could be put at risk by not having uh, the successful strategies that have been in place for a long period of time continuing. There were also some structural differences that were critical here, if I could add some of those. Yes. So CSF, the trustee company, of course, um, at this point is a master trust, and Catholic Super is a division of that master trust. And in addition to Catholic Super, we have another division, My Life, My Super. And in addition to those divisions, we also have a banking licence. We also have a financial planning service. And so when we're talking about how a future arrangements might be struck, we're not talking about just the CEO of one of the best and most successful super funds in the country. We're talking about the CEO of the organisation as a whole. And all of that is necessary background to the discussions but does it follow from the considerations you have mentioned that the only way of achieving scale would be by takeover as distinct from merger? Not the or entity remained, uh, if you like, and this is inaccurate, but if you like, the dominant uh, 
element in the combination. So clearly that would be a case-by-case -case consideration. <coughs> in this particular case, there was no doubt in our mind that the financial best interests of our members would not be served if the, if the arrangements had been different to the ones I described. Yes. Did uh, the Sydney Fund agree to the appointment of Mr Pegan as the CEO? Yes, uh, as you see, eventually it was accepted as our position. Sorry? So it was accepted? It was accepted by um, the, the Sydney, Sydney Fund, as I call yes. it. In fact, from very early on, that was their position, though, wasn't it? It was, it was conceded that that was to be the case, yes. Uh, and then, and I might have to tender that document, if I may, before I go to the next. Uh, letter CSF to ACSRF, 9 May 17, CSF. 0001-003-0349, Exhibit 5.243. Thank you, Commissioner. If I can go to CSF.009.0001.0370. This is an email that Mr Bugden sent to, or addressed to Richard, um, which is a reference to Mr Haddock. This is a few months down the track and there's been some further negotiations. And as I under, understand it, uh, Mr Bugden there says, further both ACS and CSF have agreed to all but one point to reach final agreement. I feel following our telephone conversation this afternoon, the ACS board should understand directly from me while the CSF board has come to a decision that it must appoint the chair for the new board and why Danny Casey should be that appointee. Do you see that? Yes. So had the position of the of CSF by this point changed to the actual appointment of a particular person? At this point, yes, we had, uh, we had September 27. At this point, we had taken the view that the chair should be someone other than the existing two chairs. That was a view that was being expressed by CSF, wasn't it? That's right. Um, and that was different to the view that it had expressed um, earlier on in the negotiation? <coughs> So early on in the negotiations, as you've described them, there, were, there was um, an acceptance that the chair could come from ACSRF, dependent right. on a number of other factors. Depend and, and the Sydney Fund had agreed to the other issues which were between the parties, and this um, remaining issue was the appointment of the chair, and it was CSF's position that that person um, must be Mr Casey. So in that particular instance, the, the agreement was that we'd got to the point where we needed an independent chair or someone other than the two chairs. I'll just reiterate, if I could, that uh, there'd been no heads of agreement signed, there'd been no agreement with respect to successor fund transfer and that we were still at the point of trying to, to the very best of our ability and the interests of our members get to an agreement which would satisfy what you described initially as a merger of equals? Well, that's not my language. I think that was the language of the Sydney Fund. Correct. And, but the position that CSF was putting was that there must be a particular person who should be um, the independent chair. No. So what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that if we were going to extend the negotiations and if that was predicated on a six plus six arrangement, then an independent person in addition to the six plus six would need to be found and our preference at that point in time was Danny Casey. Uh, can you explain what involvement Mr Casey had had in the negotiations during this time? 
So Mr Casey had, during this year, 2017, been employed by CSF as a consultant, given his background in the Sydney market, in the Sydney community, which we were uh, obviously trying to enter into an arrangement with and become the successor fund for, and it was felt that he was perfectly placed to be the best person to suit and satisfy the interests of the members of both funds. Was it known to the Sydney Fund that Mr Casey had been assisting CSF? I don't know. I could, sorry, I should add, it became known to me, I'm not sure at what point, fairly late in the process, that that was known to Sydney. Whether at that point, I'm not certain. Thank you. Commissioner, can I tender that document, that email, please? Dr. Haddock, 27 September 17, CSF, 0009, 0001, 0370, Exhibit 5.244. Uh, and if I may, I'll take you to the two further document, two final documents in relation to the negotiations. By October 2017, um, a response was put by the Sydney Fund, which is at CSF. Triple zero one dot triple zero three dot zero one six one. And again, this is from Mr. Haddock to Mr. Bugden, and he says, or well, he wishes to express his what he describes unwavering commitment to our, of our board to serving the best interests of our members and engaging with your board and management team in a manner that is open, transparent and in the utmost good faith. Yes. And at paragraph three, he says that there remain a number of elements of the proposed merger that require further discussion. These include the selection of the CEO and the chair of the merge fund, an agreed understanding of what is involved in combining our two Catholic funds as a merger of equals. Yes. And the proposal that's put under the heading final proposal on 0164 is that the board is only prepared to implement the merger on the following basis. <coughs> A, six directors are selected from each fund who will comprise the first 12 directors of the new board and the new board will select an independent chair through a market search process. Do you see that? Yes. CSF's CEO to be the ongoing CEO. That's still the position? Yes. And third, a merger of equals that brings together the best elements of each fund in an open, unbiased, impartial way? Yes. I could, I could tender that document. Letter A, CSRF to CSF, 26 October 17, CSF 0001, 0003, 0161, Exhibit 5.245. And I won't take you to it, but are you aware that then on receipt of this letter on the same day, Mr Bugden sent an email to um, the chair and the CEO of the Sydney Fund, Mr Haddock and Mr Cantor? I'd need to see it. Um... Um, there was an email, and I, I can't call it up for you, but the email or the, the email was in these terms. Thank you for the response. We are disappointed that you were not able to accept our offer and I wish you well for the future. Are you aware that email was sent? What was the date of that email? The 27th of October, 2017. So there was a detailed letter on the same day. I remember that date. Uh, I think- In any case was the position that, in any case was the position that CSF didn't accept or wasn't able to pursue the merger further at that time? If I could go back to the document that had it before, 164, still on the screen. Yes. Um, so the position here, once again, I'll reiterate, there's been no agreement as to successor fund transfer, no heads of agreement had been signed, no due diligence, due diligence had been done, and we have still got the suggestion that six plus six is okay without what we consider to be the continuing fund or the superior fund with respect to investment returns 
and the best interest of our members, uh, potentially having no control over who the chair might be or who the successor fund might be. So our position was quite clear that we could not continue the arrangements without having clarity around those critical issues in the best interest, interest of our members. Well, can I ask you this? There was a deal of discussion and negotiation. We've seen that. Yes. There was no agreement. We didn't reach the starting point well, of the heads of agreement. There was no agreement. If you uh, were asked the question, why did this fall over, what's your answer? My answer is that the best interests of both funds members would have been served by Catholic Super being the successor fund. So it becomes who is the fund uh, that uh, merges uh, into which? That is, which is the dominant fund? Is that right? That my understanding is that's always the case in successor fund transfer and merger negotiations. Even though there's a proposal not disputed, I think, by the end, that governance of the fund would be six plus six. Is that right? An agreement to that fact? There was no dispute. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you ever got to a final agreement. I'm just saying that the parties were at a point where each... Uh, there was no dispute that the board would be a six plus six. Is that right? We accepted six plus six on the grounds that if there wasn't an independent chair, that CSF would have the chair. So we sought separate independent legal advice to the, to the view of the importance of the chair in a successive fund arrangement going forward in the best interest of our members to protect their retirement savings given the superior performance of one fund over a long period of time. We saw no other point. option. You've, you've made that point. I just want you to uh, pause a moment. What you wanted was a six plus six board plus an independent chairman. Is that right? That was our offer. And the governance of the fund, no matter who merged into who, would rest accordingly in a board of six plus six plus one independent. Is that right? Yes. What's it matter, a hill of beans, which fund merges into which? We felt that to protect our members' interests and given our structural arrangements, as I described earlier, that it wouldn't be in our members' best interests for their retirement savings to be put at risk, given that the uh, the policies and procedures that were in place to achieve those outstanding returns might in fact not be able to be guaranteed going forward. Well, those policies and procedures are set by the board, aren't they? They are. Yes. Do go on, Mr Donnelly. You would agree, wouldn't you, that the choice of a chair or even the CEO, they're all relevant they might be relevant considerations, but the overarching consideration is always the interests of the members. Absolutely. I think the witness may have agreed and, with that and, proposition more than and, once, Mr. Donnelly. <laughs> and that was, however, at that point, the end of the negotiations. Negotiations haven't ended. So our new chair and the chair of the Sydney Fund have recommenced discussions. That's right, and I'm not gonna take you to um, those um, further discussions, but there were then some discussions which, as I understand, are ongoing from early this year. That's correct. And it's still the hope of both funds that that merger will eventually occur in the interests of members of both funds. Yes. I take you to a, another issue, one that you've raised uh, already, and that is a very important aspect of uh, oh, perhaps before I do that, Commissioner, I'll just tender that uh, letter dated the 26th of October. It's in as 5245. Yes, thank, go Thank on. you. That can be brought down. You'd agree that a very important aspect of the role of a trustee is 
to manage conflicts. Yes. And you're familiar with the general um, obligation that I've already, um, that you've already referred to. You're familiar with those general obligations, and you're, you're also familiar with the Prudential Standard SPS 521, which deals with conflicts of interest. Yes. Uh, and in fact, there is a conflict management policy within the organisation. If I can take you to CSF. Dot triple zero six dot triple zero one dot double zero three five. This is exhibit thirty seven to your first statement. Are you familiar with this policy? I am, Mr. Hazy. Now, obviously, as a general proposition, all of these policies that are in place are directed to ensuring that CSF complies with its various obligations. Correct. And. You'll note that this, is, this policy is dated April 2018. Yes. Um, but since the first of these policies, and I understand there was one by a different name, but since at least 2012, the, materially the, um, the policy has been in, in similar terms. Well, perhaps I can take you to some provisions and to the extent that Thank you me. recall that there's any difference, you can uh, indicate that. On underscore triple zero six, um, it says this conflict management policy documents the arrangements in place for managing situations giving rise to actual potential or perceived conflicts of interest and conflicts of duty together conflicts for the RSE responsible persons and employees of the trust, trustee. Yes. And the interests of the fund beneficiaries must take precedence over the interests of responsible persons and employees. Yes. And that's something with uh, an obligation with which you're well familiar. Yes. Um, and this applies to obviously you as a director, as a trustee, and your co-directors, and also um, applies to senior executives who are responsible persons. That's correct. And also to employees. Correct. On underscore triple zero nine, at 1.7.1, there's an indication that a failure by a responsible person or an employee to disclose a personal conflict is considered a serious disciplinary matter and corrective action will be determined by the board. Yes. So ultimately it's the board that takes responsibility for this policy? Yes. And at, the policy goes on to define relevant, um, relevant conflicts. Um, and without going to the specific provisions, but of course if a, there's a duty owed by the trustee or responsible person to beneficiaries, a conflict between that and duties owed by the responsible person or employee to other people, that can be a conflict. Yes. And if I can just take you to paragraph Finally, to paragraph 7.5. Uh, page. Uh, on, thank you, underscore 0018. Um, and you're aware that under the policy of a responsible person or an employee believes that another responsible person or employee <laughs> has or may have a conflict which has not been disclosed, the first responsible person or employer must bring the matter to the attention of the Chief Risk Officer or the Risk Compliance Team as relevant and provide an explanation why he or she holds that belief. Do you see that? 7.5. Uh, 7.5, yes. Yes. And I won't take you to the old policy, but <coughs> the, the Provisions to which I've, take, I've taken you are in the same terms as they were in 2012. I'm not surprised by that. I'd expect that, yes. Um, now, you raised at the start when I asked you about some matters of concern 
um, one particular issue, and that, as I understand it, was a relationship between uh, a senior executive of CSF and Australian Family. Can you explain what um, Australian Family is? So Australian Family is a, a marketing and communications network organisation that publishes some material and uh, provides support in the early education and care sector. Uh, they are also responsible for sponsoring um, the national awards, the early education and care awards. In addition, they provide general marketing and consulting services. And are you aware that CSF has used their services on a number of occasions since 2010? I am aware. And I think we've re referred, you referred to the term network, the Australian, and Australian Family Network, or it's called Australian Family. But in your evidence, more specifically, you say that um, it's constituted by Family Pack Services, PTYLTD, and Paul Clancy Consulting, PTYLTD, which was formerly known as Australian Family Magazine. Yes, they're all related parties. And you've also indicated um, in your statement that, and I'll have to refer to him as Mr Paul Clancy, and he's the CEO of Australian Family Network. Um, he's provided services, an Australian family provided services in relation to the strategy of seeking to grow the number of members of the fund? Yes. And do you yourself have knowledge of why or how it came to be that Australian family was chosen to provide services to CSF? I don't know the uh, beginnings of that relationship. Um, you're correct, though, that it has uh, been providing services to the fund since 2010. Uh, and those services include, I think you described them as um, genuine marketing and other services, is that right? So there's a number of different elements to this, uh, this arrangement. So initially, they, the, the firm was commissioned to enter into research in the childcare if I call it that at that time, in the childcare sector, uh, we, had, uh, we had developed uh, a business, strategic business plan at the time that identified that the early education space would be a potential growth area for our fund in order to achieve some of the scale desired. And the CEO commissioned some research that took place from my understanding in 2011 and 12, to confirm the prospects of that approach. And you would accept that the Head of Institutional Relations at CSF, Mr Robert Clancy, ought to have disclosed his relationship with his wife, who was a shareholder in Australian Family Pack Services? I would expect that. Um, and that she was an editor of the magazine? That was disclosed in 2015. Uh, yes, um, and you refer to that in your statement. It was um, disclosed in 2015. But it wasn't disclosed before then, was it? No. Uh, in fact, I think you might have said 2011. It matters not, but since 2010 or 2011, Australian Family had been engaged. Yes. And. Mr Robert Clancy failed to disclose that potential conflict on the register until May 2015? So the conflict was disclosed uh, on, in May 2015. Were you aware that extensive amounts of money had been paid to the organisation even before that time? Yes, they'd been contracted to provide services to the fund through that period. Uh, now. I've already referred to Paul Clancy. He's the managing director of the Australian Family Network, or the CEO. I can't recall. That's one of the. That's my understanding too. That's yes. right. And he's also the sole director of the entity known as Paul Clancy Consulting, PTYLTD. Yes. And that's never been disclosed, has it? 
onto the register. That was disclosed for the first time on July the 18th this year when I insisted it be put on. Um, before that time, Mr Robert Clancy had not disclosed that conflict to the board, or in fact in accordance with the um, conflict management proce uh, procedure, had he? The conflict with his brother? Yes. No, he had not. It seems... I can take you to CSF.0009.0001.386 You'll see this is an email from August 2010. And Paul Clancy writes to his brother Robert, so Robert's with CSF. in relation to the third paragraph of his email, I'm suggesting that Catholic Super continue their sponsorship to almost formalise the platinum sponsor status I have provided for the past two years. Do you see that? Yes. And um, then, I think this is a reference to what you may have referred to before as the first stop point, undertake a research study to determine other players in the market, how they are perceived and what and how they do to promote themselves in the sector. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and that was sent by Paul to his brother. And there's a reference then, or a response from CSF, or from Robert Clancy at CSF. This all sounds good. Are you suggesting 30 to 40,000 per year? Yes, I can see that. So that appears to be, or it may not even be the first, but that's certainly a reference to the sort of work that uh, that you referred to earlier in your evidence. So the reference to the work, yes. Um, has Mr Pegan ever raised an issue with the board that Robert Clancy has or may have a conflict which has not been disclosed? So if I take you to the conflict, the, um, the matter we were talking about before. Yes. When the conflict was first registered with the board in 2015, that's in relation to Mr Robert Clancy's wife. That's correct. So the control put in place at that time was that only Mr Pegan would have any relationship with Australian family and that had been the case since the beginning of the relationship, 2010. So the board at that point, 2015, were clearly of the of the view, of the mind, of the understanding that Mr Pegan, the CEO, because of the obvious conflict of interest, had managed the relationship entirely. And based on your preparation for today, are you satisfied that that is the case? No, I'm not. There are numerous examples of email correspondence between the brothers, which are a breach of not only the conflict policy but the email and internet policy, for example, and... Yeah. All right, and I won't take you to all of those, but... And I'll return in a moment to what Mr Pegan did in May 2015. But you'd know, and, and in your statement, you set out the payments that have been made to Australian families since 1 January 2013. Yes. And they amount to $1.5 million. Yes. And $500,000 in sponsorship expenses to Australian family. So the sponsorships would specifically be for the Early Education and Child Care Awards, which we were a major sponsor of at that time. Um, so in, in total, two, $2 million has passed from CSF to Australian Family? Over the period of time that you're talking about, yes. So I, I, I can add, though, that um, this has been an, an evolution in terms of services contracted. So you mentioned the sponsorship and, and I mentioned the, the sponsorship of the awards. Um, in addition to that, there's been the research done by Paul Clancy that was commissioned uh, in, in the beginning of the relationship and 
you've, you've then got the uh, evolution, as I'll describe it, to other work contracted. I understand. So, in fact, if I, if I go through those numbers, the two million you described, about 42% of that two million has, in fact, been in a branding uh, exercise which coincided with the decision based on the research done by Paul Clancy to look at a different identity in terms of our master trust. So in fact, the research indicated quite clearly that Catholic super was not going to be uh, an identity, to put it that way, which may well have gained traction in this new market that we were seeking as part of our business plan to grow the business in order to achieve the scale we've talked about earlier. And so part of that was you need to come up with a different identity to attract those people who might have issues with the Catholic name as a potential merger partner or as a potential, as a potential uh, yeah, merger partner, I'll put it that way. In fact, that initial work led to discussions around a master trust. So that work around the master trust and all of the work involved in that took place in that period, 2013-14. And in fact, the master trust set up Catholic Division, My Life, My Super Division, into which prospective early education and care workers would be placed. In addition, of course, every other potential merger, like our successful merger with Transport Industry Super in 2016, they've now moved into that My Life, My Super division. Prospective mergers, even the Sydney Fund you've talked about, that would have been an opportunity to form a division under the Master Trust. So Australian family, uh, if you're talking about two million, and I'm talking about 42%, so you're talking 800,000 of that money was specifically in the branding space. And are you, are you aware of what other work was done by CSF to ensure that that amount was an appropriate amount to spend on those services? So that quantum, which of course has been um, calculated in the course of preparation for this hearing, um, is the subject now of an independent review that's been commissioned to do precisely that. We have now commissioned an independent study to assess the total money spent, the nature of the contracts, the value to members of that money being spent. If I understand your evidence, it's that Mr Clancy was engaged to do research about ways to expand in a particular segment of the market, is that right? Initially, correct. Yeah. And in fact, that period was before 1 January 2013, wasn't it? Yes. So that wouldn't even be part of the $2 million, would it? So going back to 2010, the $2 million, I think, I couldn't be corrected here. My understanding is it goes back to 2011. There could be extra money in 2010 that wasn't sought as part of this information. That will be part of the review, though, I just described. That will so go back how to far sort. back do you intend to go in terms of your review? To the inception of the contract. Now, it's not a criticism because you were asked to provide the figures from 1 January 2013 and you do that in your statement at Schedule I-20C. Yes. But that doesn't go back before 1 January 2013. So you accept that there may be even more funds that were paid in that early period for that research? We certainly know the research was done in 2011-12. So I, I presume yes. And if I understand it correctly, you relied on his research to then do work in terms of branding in the childcare sector, is that correct? One of the outcomes of the, res of the research was the identity issue that I described. And then Australian Family was paid, on your figures, 42% of the $2 million for doing that very branding exercise, wasn't it? Yes. You say in your evidence that due to the familial relationship between Paul and Robert Clancy and Jennifer Kernahan, Robert Clancy's status as Head of Institutional Relations at CSF, dealings between CSF and the Australian family entities,
have been conducted by CSF's CEO, Frank Pegan, and or its COO, is that correct? That's correct. And you've referred to this and you say this at paragraph 114 of your statement that Frank Pegan confirmed to the Deputy CEO, Head of Compliance, and Rob Clancy that the nature of the controls that he had in place with regard to his management of the relationship between CSF and the Australian family entities were that negotiations with Australian family entities were to be conducted by Frank Pegan and management of the arrangements with Australian family entities was to be conducted by Frank Pegan. That's the assurance I described earlier when the conflict was first registered. And having prepared your statement yes. and prepared to give evidence today, do you consider that accurately reflects what has actually happened? So this is, can you read the statement again? Yes, I'll take you to paragraph 114 yes. of your statement. It's your second statement, I'm sorry, Mr Hazy. Second statement, thank you. Yes. So on that date, May 22, 2015, we received an assurance from Mr Pegan that negotiations had been conducted only by him and that the management of those arrangements was conducted by Frank Pegan. Now, clearly, since that time, as you can see from the emails, that situation has not been has not been the case. That, that has not been managed that way. And in fact, well, in, in your well, state, what, uh, what follows from that? Perhaps we can cut to the chase. What's the consequence that then follows? Uh, the fund is investigating these matters. Correct. Has that so investigation concluded? The investigation has not concluded. So Mr. Clancy has been placed on leave and there's an investigation into this matter. And has the board formed any view about what uh, it should do in response to the matter yet? The board is, has not finalised that view. No. Yes. Um, perhaps that's an opportune time to tender that email, Commissioner, if I may. It's the email no, from... Clancy to Clancy, 26 August uh, 2010, CSF uh, 009 001 3867 becomes Exhibit 5.246. And in fairness to you, you say in your statement that since preparing your first witness statement, you've become aware that Mr Clancy um, appears to have sent emails to Australian family and purported to approve payments without authority on three occasions. I That's think correct. you said that, Mr and Donnelly. And are you aware um, of his involvement in any other payments? No, I'm not aware, I'm not aware of any other payments that he's actually approved. Uh, and but it might I add that's also part of the investigation that we've just commissioned. Thank you. And that are you aware that Rob Clancy attended meetings with Paul Clancy and other CSF employees, including the CEO, to discuss the work undertaken by Australian Family? Once again, that's become very evident with the string of emails that have been uh, presented to me during the course of my preparation. Uh, and in fact, as recently as um, as recently as um, the 29th of May um, this year, um, Paul and Rob have been um, engaged in email com communications about particular tasks for CSF. It's fair to say it's been continuous. Um, and you, you're also aware that um, Confidential information has also been disclosed in the course um, of that period of time, or for a period of time by Mr Clancy, confidential information of CSF to Mr Paul Clancy. That's, I've been made aware of that during this period. Uh, can I come to one final issue in relation to final issues in relation to this? Um, 
Australian family. The first is CSF uh, purchased the awards, did it not, from Australian family um, in 2017? That's correct. Uh, and if I can take you to CSF.0009.0001.2557. It's an email from Mr Robert Clancy to Mr Paul Clancy. And if I can go to the next page. Have you... It might be a different document with CSF.0009.0001.255. What are we trying to establish, Mr Donnelly? The witnesses said that uh, uh, the award was purchased. He said that there's a continuing investigation. What are we trying to establish? I don't think I need to take that matter further. Can I go to the last... Um, issue I'd like to deal with. Um, in your statement, you also um, acknowledge that that same um, employee, there's been 46,000 of expenses um, which were unauthorised in the period of 2013 to 2016. That's correct. Um, and that's, of course, in breach of the corporate card use policy. Yes. And you're aware this came to a head in early 2016? It came to a head? came to a head when uh, Mr Clancy was given a letter in early 2016. Do you recall giving evidence about that in your second statement? So the review that um, established the $46,000 of unauthorised expenses took place at that time. I, just, I can't recall if that's what you're referring to. Yes. Thank well, you. In, in fairness to you, if I take you briefly to PJH61, CSF.0010.0001.0839. This isn't dated, but in your evidence you say that it was in early 2016. Yes. And it was written by one of CSF's finance team, is that right? That's my understanding. It's not uh, signed, but that's my understanding. How did this letter come to your attention? This letter was found in Mr Clancy's uh, drawer after he was put on leave. When? when? Uh, a matter of weeks ago. So this issue wasn't elevated to the board at the time? No. Uh, and That's right. It's your evidence that the money was paid back, is that right? The $46,000 identified has been repaid. And are you satisfied as a board member of the processes that the personal expenses on that credit card have ceased thereafter? No. Is that part of the current inquiry? Absolutely. So the, the review into Mr Clancy's uh, credit card use and, his, and the personal uh, use of that card uh, will commence from the first day of his employment to the present day. Uh, and in your statement, you also identify a long-standing practice which was not documented, which allowed senior executive staff to incorporate personal travel and accommodation and other minor expenditure, provided it was reimbursed. Do you recall that? I do. And that's gone on for 10 years? It's come to my attention in, the, in recent in, and in preparation. When you accept that that's plainly contrary to policy as well? It is. It is. Might I add that uh, immediately uh, that came to my attention, or in the last few weeks, that policy now has been uh, restated and reaffirmed and that long-standing practice has now ceased. <coughs> And these matters... Um... Just by way of context, if I could, um, in, my, in my preparation, I, I note that most of these would be with respect to spouse travel and that uh, in the, I've been informed that in the booking process, the staff member would make the booking for two 
and in all of the cases where I've asked for this to be checked, those uh, private expenses have been repaid immediately. That's been the long-standing practice. In addition to the long-standing practice of being, allowing it, the repayment has been certainly uh, carried out. But that's ongoing, that inquiry, is it? Is that inquiry ongoing? So the inquiry into Mr, Mr. Clancy's personal use? Definitely. Um, that's uh, due for completion. Uh, I'm thinking, I was going to say the 21st of August, but I'll, I'll say before the end of this month. Thank you. And in fact, it was the preparation of that rubric, which, of, of your statement in answer to that rubric, which actually raised some of these matters for your attention and for the attention of the board? The credit card review took place in 13 to 16. Now, I wasn't aware of that review until preparation for this hearing. Should the board have been informed of that? I believe so. Uh, and just so I can understand what the inquiry is, will that deal with, uh, will that deal with others who hold credit cards and who might have used this long-standing practice? So the process for use of credit cards is that there are a number of steps where those credit cards should be signed off and that should be of course by your manager and uh, in the case of uh, Mr Clancy and uh, in the case of Mr Pegan who's also, uh, you've asked specifically for his, where they might not have been signed off. Uh, the investigation will include both of those credit cards. Uh, so the finance team have assured me that there are no other instances. Uh, and the final issue in relation to that that I just want to raise is you say uh, in your statement in relation to uh, these credit card expenses that Mr. that after this came to the executive's attention in 2016, Mr Clancy's credit card was signed off by people above him, is that right? That's correct. Um, and have you, um, have you had reason to look at those approvals from, that were given in respect of his credit card? Yes. Um, and are you aware that in fact he didn't have his credit card approved by um, as required by the Chief Risk Officer uh, for most of 2017? That's not my understanding. Um, if I can take you to this final document, um, CSF.0015.0001.0022 Did you consider these documents in preparing to give evidence today? I have seen these. Do you see, well perhaps I can take you to the actual documents rather than the summary which has been prepared by someone within your organisation. If I can go to point zero zero two three. This is February 2017. And if you go to, so there the various expenses there and it's in your, in your evidence you say this was signed off by David, which I think is a reference to David O'Sullivan, the Chief Risk Officer. Yeah, so the previous page showed you that there were two months, December, January, which I understand coincided with Mr Clancy's uh, period of leave uh, that weren't signed. Perhaps you want to go to the next page, 0024. Yes. Now, for those sitting here, it may not be of much use because this is redacted. Whose signature appears above the manager's name and signature? So mine's redacted too. Um, you're just showing that. So that appears to be Mr Clancy's signature. Thank you. No further questions, Commissioner. Are you tendering that last document, Mr. Uh, yes. Um, credit if, card expenditures. 
Yes, if Robert I could. Robert Clancy, CSF 0015-0001-0022, Exhibit 5.247. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Brereton. No re-examination. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr Hazy, you, yes? I have leave to appear for SCS Superstar. Yes. Austin. Yes, Mr. Austin. Uh, I haven't told your your commission so far, but uh, there's an issue about evidence in relation to uh, CSF and SCS. I think uh, Mr. Nelly has something to tell. If I can interrupt my learned friend, as you may be aware, Commissioner, in response to two rubrics, CSF, C, C, sorry, SCS has provided a statement of Mr. Hartley and a Mr. Cantor. Uh, those statements will be tendered. We'd hope to tender them now, Commissioner. It's just we've got some issues with getting it onto the system, but they will be tendered in a bundle uh, before the end of the week. And with the exhibits? With their exhibits. I mean, if, that if that's done, does that solve the difficulties oh, you've... We need to refer to them in submissions if the Commission's asked to make any findings on the... the well, Exhibit 5.248 will be the statement of Mr Hartley. Exhibit 5.249 will be the statement of Mr Cantor. The further details will be uh, of those exhibits will be provided once they uh, uh, make it into the system, but it will uh, keep the exhibit markings reasonably proximate. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr Austin. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, if uh, yes. Mr Hazy can be excused. Yes, Mr Hazy, thank you very much. You may step down. You're excused. I take it we have a changing of the guard, do we, Mr There is. Some, Mr Hodge will be here in a moment, uh, as well as my learned friend, Dr Collins, for ANZ. Yes. Uh, 3.15. Thank you, Commissioner.